Good evening. Welcome uh, to this, uh, the 13th annual international conference on Central and Southwest Asia. Uh, we feel very privileged and honored to have all of you with us. And tonight promises to be a very special occasion because we have a very distinguished professor, scholar, and colleague with us. But before we start uh, tonight, uh, let me first express uh, my personal gratitude, but also uh, the gratitude of the Central and Southwest Asian Studies Center at the University of Montana for all the individuals and organizations uh, which have uh, sponsored and helped us organize uh, this very important conference. Uh, before I start, uh, I need to mention my colleagues in the Central Southwest Asian Studies, without whom uh, this conference would have been impossible to organize. Uh, first and foremost, my two very distinguished colleagues, Professor Ardeshir Kia. Ardi, where are you? Uh, please stand up and be recognized. <laughs> <laughs> and my very dear colleague and friend, Professor Samir Bitar. the founder of our Arabic language program. Without Ardi and Samir, none of this would have been possible. I also would like to uh, express my uh, personal thanks to the Montana World Affairs Council for co-sponsoring this event, to the Department of History and its chair, Professor Robert Green, and uh, the offices of the provost of the University of Montana and uh, the office of the president of the University of Montana for always supporting our efforts, as well as uh, the Department of Modern and Classical Languages and Literatures and the Russian Studies Program at the University of Montana. Without uh, your support, uh, this would not have been possible. Uh, now I have the honor to introduce to you a very special friend and colleague, um, a relatively new arrival at the University of Montana, uh, Dr. Nathan Lindsay, who is our Associate Provost for Dynamic Learning. And uh, Nathan would give us a welcome, and then we will start with the presentation. Nathan. Thank you so much, Dr. Kia. <clears throat> I am delighted to be here and so grateful to see so many of you and want to also welcome you to this 13th annual uh, international conference on Central and Southwest Asian Studies. To me, this is a very exciting event. And um, during this uh, conference, you'll hear many aspects of, uh, about uh, so many areas in Asia. And you'll hear about different languages, in Chinese and Arabic and Russian. I lived for two years in Russian, in Russia. And I want to help you practice just for a second some Russian. So if you could repeat after me, please say, Dobry vechir. Dobry vechir. You just said, Good evening. So I say to all, all of you, Dobry vechir. And I'm so delighted to see so many of you um, students who are here, and faculty and staff, and people from the community, and people from uh, other countries. I don't know who wins the award for the person who traveled the farthest. Uh, but whoever you are, uh, we're, we're so grateful um, for the thousands of miles you traveled. Um, as you heard earlier, um, Dr. Kia and his colleagues, um, Dr. Kia again, and uh, Dr. Batar, and other, other colleagues have worked so hard uh, to make this possible and just developed an incredible schedule of uh, panels and presentations. There are four each day, uh, three that already happened today and tonight, and then four tomorrow, 
and 4 on, Sat on Friday. And we hope that you will join us for all of those. Um, if you could join me again in saying thank you to Dr. Kia and all of his colleagues, it would be most grateful. <laughs> A lot of work and everything that this conference represents are things that I feel very strongly about. As you come to these sessions, you'll learn about uh, many aspects of culture, of uh, politics, of language, of different peoples. And um, all of these things may be different from your own. And that, those learning experiences are things that we gain by being on a college campus, by inviting colleagues from across the world to learn from others. I want you to think for just a second about the most significant experience that you had in college. If you, if you went to college and think back however long ago that was, um, what was most meaningful from that experience? Was it a, a class that you had or uh, an interaction you had with someone in the community or um, a other type of experience where you went somewhere? Um, we actually did research on this across the country as part of the Wabash National Study of Liberal Arts Education and went to many different campuses and would interview students, hundreds of students, asking them, what were your expectations for college and what were your most, what was the most meaningful experience? And time and time again, people would talk about opportunities to interact with people who were different from them, to go to um, places across the country or across the world and learn about other cultures and people and language, or to have a roommate who was from a different area of the country or the world. That is what those opportunities to learn about other places and people and cultures and everything that entails is exactly what this conference is about. There's been a lot of research done about the benefits of study abroad and tomorrow there's a panel of students, our student scholars, uh, who have tra traveled the world and I hope you get an opportunity to uh, hear from that panel. Some of the research on study abroad uh, that's been done on thousands of college students um, highlights some of the learning outcomes or the benefits of students who have had those opportunities. And listen to this list just for, for a second. Um, students report, thousands of students report increased self-confidence, um, increased maturity, a lasting impact on worldview. They have higher academic commitment, more intercultural development, and more career development. So there are uh, intrapersonal benefits for, uh, for the student's own identity, uh, intercultural development, uh, interpersonal development, and also academic development. Uh, how many of you have spent just a little bit of time uh, in another country? Let's raise your hands. Uh, I think if I were to, able to talk to all of you, you would, you would relate how those experiences and those travels impacted your life. Um, living in Russia for a couple of years, it, it definitely was a life changer. And I'm so grateful that this institution and Dr. Kia and all of his colleagues facilitate these type of conversations. I hope you know a little bit about uh, the Center uh, for uh, Center, uh, Central and Southwest Asian Studies. Uh, it has so many different events and experiences, both in brown bags and in summer trips and in talks and presentations that are made across uh, campus and across the, the city and across the state and across the world. Uh, there's also very strong academic programs in, for an academic major and an academic minor, uh, f different uh, focuses on um, Arabic and Chinese and Russian, and just a, a huge wealth of opportunities. I'm also very excited that uh, tonight the Dr. Green is going to be speaking to you about uh, Russia and Ukraine and about the importance of language. I have a book on my shelf uh, that's a book, uh, I don't know how many Russian speakers we have here, but it's a book of pogovorkis, of different sayings in Russian. And one of those sayings uh, goes something like this, and my Russian is very old and bad, so please bear with me, but it says something like, Shasya sebeshastyam nadnik sanyak lezdit. Basically, that happiness and unhappiness, or challenge and opportunity, 
travel in the same sled. And with the uh, dissolution of the USSR and the, an awakening of many different opportunities, with those opportunities have come a lot of happiness and unhappiness and challenge and opportunity. And uh, seeing some of the things that Dr. Green has written, I think you'll find his presentation tonight to be fascinating. So again, we welcome you to this conference. We're so glad you're here. We thank everyone who's worked so hard, and I'm excited uh, to learn tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nathan. Uh, now, and without any further ado, I would like to present you my dearest and closest friend and colleague uh, since the day I arrived, Professor Michael Mayer, a distinguished professor of US history, a prolific writer, an outstanding scholar. And Michael will introduce us to Professor Robert Green. So with no further ado, Professor Michael Mayer. Thank you, Matt. I, I was a little worried it might be my funeral when I heard that. I was checking, checking the pulse. Um, good evening, and uh, welcome to the first keynote presentation of this, the uh, 13th Annual International Conference on Central and Southwest Asia. And I'd like to join uh, everybody else who's spoken in thanking particularly Meredad and Artie Kia for bringing this event to the University of Montana year after year. Um, and I hope it goes on for many more. Uh, tonight, it's my privilege and pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Robert Green, an Associate Professor of History at the University of Montana. It, it really is something of a formality to say it's a pleasure to introduce somebody, but in this case, it's the absolute truth. Uh, Rob is an accomplished historian, a colleague, a terrific speaker, as you'll see shortly. Uh, after graduating summa cum laude in history for, and Russian studies from the University of Rochester, Rob did his PhD at the University of Michigan. He taught at Michigan for two years before we were lucky enough to hire him here at UM. Rob's work has dealt primarily with the social and cultural history of Orthodox religion in Russia and the Soviet Union. He co-edited a collection of essays titled Orthodox Russia, Belief and Practice Under the Czars. And in 2010, he published Bodies Like Bright Stars, Saints and Relics in Orthodox Russia. The book examines the relationship between Orthodox believers and their saints in late Tsarist and early Soviet Russia. The book pays particular attention to the role of relics. The Orthodox faithful prayed to saints for help with their everyday needs and their everyday concerns. They did so through shrines and relics. Uh, one time I heard Rob describe the relationship between the supplicants and their saints. Uh, he said the supplicants regarded uh, the, the shrines as spiritual ATMs, and I think that's a, a fair assessment. Uh, Rob's book is a model of scholarship. It's carefully researched. It offers bold and original analysis, but it's also beautifully written. A couple of years after that, I think it was, with Eugene of Rutin, he translated and co-edited the memoirs of Anna Pavlovna uh, Vygotskaya. I, you can check my pronunciation on that, Rob. Um, uh, described as an ordinary Jewish woman in the Russian Empire. She escaped the Pale of Settlement to St. Petersburg, where she became a Mont Montessori teacher and advocated early childhood education in the years after the Russian Revolution. She was murdered in 1943 by the Nazis. She was 75 years old. Two particular things distinguish Rob. First, he's that unusual historian who reads widely beyond his narrow field of scholarly expertise and indeed beyond his discipline. The other, I think, can be summed up in a story. When Rob came to interview for the position he holds now at UM, he gave his research presentation. And I was sitting next to a close friend and a highly accomplished scholar who after the talk acknowledged that Rob was good, but he was a bit of a wise guy, except he didn't say guy. Um, he used part of the anatomy to symbolize the whole. Uh, I, I corrected his analysis. Um, from my perspective, Rob was very good, and and not but, um, is a bit of a wise guy. I didn't use guy, what, guy either for the record. Um, all of Rob's work has been marked by the clarity and analytical force of his presentation, his impressive and wide learning, and his wit. So I look forward to his talk tonight with great anticipation. 
Rob's topic is language and politics in the modern Ukraine. And please join me in giving a warm welcome to Professor Robert Green. Thanks. I hope this is good. <laughs> Thanks to Nathan and, and Mike and Meta, of course, for the warm welcome. Um, <clears throat> I'll begin with an anecdote. One autumn evening in 1995, hundreds of thousands of television viewers across Ukraine tuned in, as they did every week, to watch the latest episode of the number one television show in the country, Santa Barbara. The American soap opera had ended its nine-season run in the United States two years before, but reruns remained wildly popular uh, in syndication across the former Soviet Union. The audience was primarily made up of retired pensioners living on the equivalent of 20 U.S. dollars a month, for whom the ongoing exploits and steamy scandals of the Capwell clan and their perennial rivals, the Lockridge family, must have seemed like glimpses into another world. The broadcast signal of the Russian state television network in Moscow was powerful enough to reach across the border into eastern Ukraine. And so viewers in eastern Ukraine and the Crimean Peninsula were accustomed to watching Santa Barbara and dozens of other programs dubbed into Russian. On this particular night, however, audiences were astonished to hear the Capwells speaking Ukrainian. The largest Ukrainian television company had purchased the rights to Santa Barbara from an American distributor and with the permission of the Ukrainian parliament had dumped the Russian broadcast and begun to air the show dubbed into Ukrainian. Now from a purely linguistic standpoint, Ukrainian and Russian are very similar. They belong to the family of East Slavic languages. They share a more or less uh, similar grammatical structure, whether more or less depends on whom you ask. They share a more or less common alphabet, the Cyrillic, with a few uh, additional letters in the Ukrainian rendition. They differ, however, in spelling, vocabulary, certain vowel and consonant pronunciations are markedly different as well. Uh, a comparison often invoked is that between uh, Spanish and Portuguese, similar languages but decidedly distinct. Linguists estimate there's about a 35% lexical overlap between Russian and Ukrainian. Unfortunately, that overlap does not include certain vocabulary critical to soap opera audiences. Russian and Ukrainian have completely different words for love, father, child, pregnant, and betrayal. Without these key concepts, the intricate plots of most soap operas uh, are rendered utterly incomprehensible to all but the most ardent of fans. A 58-year-old Russian-speaking woman in the Crimean city of Bach uh, Bakhtisarai told a reporter, my heart fell when the broadcast switched into Ukrainian. I didn't understand what was going on. This unexpected switch could not have come at a more inopportune time. Eden Capwell had just been kidnapped by the Carnation Killer. And Cruz Castillo, who I think is the father of her as yet unborn child, was hot on the trail to rescue his beloved. And in Crimea, where a majority of the population is ethnic Russian, identified primarily as Russian speakers, angry uh, Russian viewers flooded the TV station switchboards with irate phone calls, furious that they could no longer indulge in their favorite programming in their native tongue. Network officials, uh, beginning to learn the uh, mechanisms of capitalism, assured audiences that this change was, in fact, an improvement. Viewers would now be able to watch the show five days a week instead of two. The Russian-speaking audiences, however, appear to have viewed this as just more of a bad thing. And so in the days that followed that autumn, citizens exercised their democratic rights in search of recourse. The local cell of the Communist Party in the Crimean capital of Simferopol organized a demonstration with more than 500 angry protesters marching on the Crimean parliament, petitioning their regional government to take action. Newspaper editorials suggested that the decision to uh, take the Russian language version of Santa Barbara off the air carried with it a greater risk of civil unrest than cutting state salaries and subsidized pensions had the year before. 
The deputy chairman of the Crimean parliament, Vladimir Podkopayev, told reporters only half-jokingly that Crimea was in a state of emergency. My wife told me not to come home again until Santa Barbara is in Russian once more, he pledged. So in the end, parliament was spurred into action and authorized a special bill to appease the aggrieved audiences and restored the Russian-dubbed soap opera to the airwaves. The Baroque storylines of the soap opera notwithstanding, the truth is that most viewers in eastern Ukraine could understand the basic contours of the plot, whether it was in Ukrainian or in Russian. But for those who protested in the streets and flooded the TV stations with uh, phone calls, the question was about more than comprehension. It was about comfort. As one protester explained to a reporter, it's like an old friend you've known for years suddenly changing her voice. It was strange and unfamiliar. And the aggrieved parties felt that their evening entertainments, indeed their private lives, were under attack. That Russian speakers, like themselves, were being subjected to what the protesters called Ukrainianization. And indeed, the argument has been made that the decision to air the program in Ukrainian dubbing was a strategic one undertaken by the Ukrainian government to create greater exposure uh, for the Ukrainian language, to create an impetus for people to learn Ukrainian, to keep up with the Capwells and the Lockridges, and to foster a growing sense of Ukrainian cultural and national identity among the citizenry. The Santa Barbara affair, as it's come to be known, seems uh, quaint and mundane when compared to the crises of today, yet I would argue that it encapsulates in miniature the enduring difficulties that citizens in the Ukrainian state continue to face on an everyday level over the question of language. As this map suggests, uh, the Ukrainian population is ethnically, linguistically diverse, split between Ukrainian speakers and Russian speakers, to say nothing of ethnic minority groups who speak Tatar, Polish, Romanian, Hungarian, Bulgarian, or Greek. And so the question facing Ukraine's citizens since independence uh, and at the height of the Santa Barbara crisis in 1995 was not so simple as it might appear at first glimpse. Indeed, it remains largely unresolved to this day. In what language would Ukraine's citizens consume and produce their culture, conduct business, educate their children, read their mail, absorb the news, and interact with the state in myriad ways? The language question is one that Ukrainian politicians have waded into again and again over the past 20 odd years. It's a question that has deep implications for issues of national identity. But it's also an issue that millions of ordinary Ukrainians negotiate every day in the dozens, even hundreds of daily interactions they experience at home and in public, in school or at the workplace, at the store or walking down the street. The language question is not an innocuous one. Whether one chooses to think, talk, write, shop, or watch soap operas in either Russian or Ukrainian has much to say about that individual's national and political identity and how that individual views his or her country's past, present, and indeed future. So the argument that I want to pursue this evening is that the language question has been for the past 200 odd years and remains to this day a salient one. That it's a kind of cultural fault line along which we can plot and begin to make sense of the political crises facing Ukraine and its people to this day. The fighting that's taken place in Ukraine over the past two years is, in some way, a continuation by other means of the fierce language wars that have raged across the region for the past 200 years. We often think of national identity as something primordial, when in fact it is historically conditioned. Scholars of nationalism since Benedict Anderson identify the origins of nationalism in the 18th century, when the growth and spread of print culture made it possible for the first time for Englishmen, Frenchmen, Germans, Russians, and so on to imagine themselves as part of a national community that stretched beyond the borders of their town or village and united them into a collective community that transcended social and economic hierarchies, a national community of shared language, shared culture, and shared values. What we now know as Ukraine today was, for most of the 19th century, and until the end of the First World War, a land divided uh, between two empires, the Russian and the Austrian. And the course of Ukrainian nationalism as it emerged in the 19th century followed a course similar to that of other so-called submerged peoples 
dominated politically, economically, and culturally by imperial powers who subscribed to a different culture, prayed to different gods or to the same god differently, and spoke different languages. Nationalist movements in Eastern and Central Europe uh, emerged in the first, and, uh, first half and middle of the 19th century, first as cultural and later as political movements directed against an occupying presence that they identified as other, as foreign. National identity, not surprisingly, was often strongest among those peoples who had no states of their own. In the Austrian Empire, for example, minority populations of Hungarians, Czechs, Slovaks, Romanians, Italians, and Slovenes came over the course of the first half of the 19th century to bristle against the rule of a German-speaking imperial dynasty that did not recognize their individual separate status as distinct, unique national communities. And consciously, defiantly, refusing to identify with their imperial masters, nationalist-minded groups in Eastern Europe celebrated their own national cultures as unique, distinct, as something innate and inseparable from the people. And for their part, imperial regimes tended to look askance at these kinds of nationalist manifestations as sources of potential political and social unrest. So in what is today Ukraine, nationalism began to emerge in the 19th century, as it did in much of East and Central Europe, as a movement of artists, students, and intellectuals who sought to recover what they imagined to be a true and authentic Ukrainian culture that had been suppressed by their Austrian or Russian overlords. And like their counterparts among the Hungarians, the Czechs, the Slovaks, and so on, Ukrainian nationalists looked to the common people, the common people uh, were the repository of an authentic national culture, a national way of life, untainted, uncorrupted by outside foreign influence. And this was a common conceit in 19th century uh, European nationalist movements, that the common people, the peasantry, uh, were the guarantors and preservers of a true and authentic national culture. And that it was to them that nationalists should look for inspiration in questions of language, dress, custom, tradition, songs, stories, etc. It's no accident that the uh, young German romantic nationalists, uh, Jakob and Wilhelm Grimm, the brothers Grimm, went in search of true and authentically German tradition, uh, went to the peasants, and collected what we now know as Grimm's fairy tales. Similar undertakings uh, occurred in the Ukrainian countryside. Here you see a painting by a 19th century Ukrainian artist and nationalist, Vasil Sternberg depicting a typical village fair, showing the common folk in uh, colorful national dress. And this idea of sort of going to the people to recover uh, national culture, to recover tradition, was less an act of recovery uh, than it was of creation. What these cultural explorers could not find among the common folk, or those traditions that they found ill-suited to their purposes, they simply recast uh, or even invented outright. So the story of Ukrainian nationalism in the 19th century is a story of a small minority of elite activists asserting their national specificity and distinctiveness against claims to the contrary from their imperial overlords. The Austrians, and especially the Russians, sought to stifle Ukrainian national sentiment before it had the chance to blossom. And here I think the czars were concerned, the Russian czars were concerned that if the Ukrainians uh, were to be infected with nationalism, they might become as unruly a set of subjects as their Polish neighbors, who had risen up against Russian rule uh, in 1830-31, and again in the 1860s. So the language issue became one of critical importance for Ukrainian nationalists. They celebrated the Ukrainian language not as a crude and folksy offshoot of Russian, but as the true authentic language of the East Slavic peoples. They saw Russian, by contrast, as of a more recent and decidedly less pure provenance, tainted as it was by unmelodious consonant clusters and crass obscenities, which they chalked up to the legacy of centuries of Mongol rule back in the medieval period. 19th century Ukrainian poets and nationalists like Taras Shevchenko composed verses and plays in Ukrainian as a means to champion Ukrainian as a true literary language in its own right not just as a sort of argo for noblemen to use when conversing with their peasant serfs. 
The publication in 1840 of Shevchenko's first volume of poetry has been described by one modern day literary scholar as the single most important event in the history of Ukrainian literature. He is now regarded as a national hero in Ukraine. There are statues of Shevchenko all across the country, streets named in his honor. Uh, he was a poet, a painter, a polymath. Shevchenko is often referred to as the Ukrainian Ben Franklin, and indeed his face too adorns Ukrainian currency, appearing on uh, the 100 hryvna note, the equivalent of our $100 bill. Nationalist-minded scholars like the historian Mykola Kostomarov sought to write a history of the Ukrainian past that celebrated the homeland and the people as a nation in their own right, not simply as the little cousins or little brothers of the Russians. And both men, rough contemporaries, both men born into serfdom, were influential in the creation uh, in 1845 of the Brotherhood of Saints Cyril and Methodius, an underground secret society and reading group that sought not only to assert the unique distinctiveness of the Ukrainian nation, but uh, the political goal of bringing down the Russian autocracy, the abolition of serfdom. They sought to replace the Russian Empire with a fraternal confederation of Slavic nations, a sort of united Slavic states. The stated goals of the Brotherhood demonstrate, I think, how the cultural and political aspirations of Ukrainian nationalists began to grow uh, and amplify and, in a certain sense, converge over the course of the 19th century. The name of the organization uh, is telling. Cyril and Methodius were, of course, the Byzantine missionaries who converted the Slavs to Christianity way back when and who had drawn up the first Slavic alphabet, hence Cyrillic, after St. Cyril. In the 19th century, members of the Brotherhood imagined themselves as missionaries for the gospel of the Ukrainian nation. This, of course, was highly illegal, and sentiments such as this could not sit well with the Russian ruling elite, uh, particularly not with the Tsar Nicholas I. He was known popularly at home and abroad as the gendarme of Europe for his eagerness to use force to put down popular risings. And Nicholas saw the rise of Ukrainian nationalism as a direct challenge to his status uh, as czar, his authority from the hand of God to rule over his people. And so in 1847, Nicholas's police broke up the Brotherhood, arrested its members, tried them on charges of political sedition, and sent them into internal exile in Siberia. Shevchenko was sentenced to 10 years labor in Siberia. And the emperor himself, with his own pen, added a line in the margins of the sentence uh, indicating that Shevchenko was to be deprived of any opportunity to write or paint because he was a troublemaker. The experience of Siberian labor ruined Shevchenko's health. It led to his premature death in 1861, just weeks before uh, Nicholas's successor uh, abolished the institution of serfdom. The Russian imperial government in the 19th century, like other imperial powers ruling over diverse and multinational uh, populations, drew a connection, a clear connection, between nationalist sentiment and political rebellion. And the uh, reprisals taken against the Brotherhood of St. Cyril and Methodius, I think, makes that clear. The quickest means to uh, eliminate uh, nationalist sentiment in hopes of forestalling uh, political unrest was to declare war on the Ukrainian language. And the first major efforts at this were undertaken in the, uh, in the reign of the arch-conservative Nicholas I, but continued uh, under the rule of his son and heir, Alexander II, the emperor known as the Tsar Emancipator. He liberated the Russian serfs in 1861, uh, but at the same time was deeply concerned about the dangers of Ukrainian nationalism. In 1863, Alexander's Minister of the Interior, the head of the uh, Imperial Police, Pyotr Valuyev, issued a decree that has come to be known as the Valuyev Circular. It was circulated to all Imperial governors, particularly in the Western provinces of the Empire, and the Valuyev Circular banned the publication of textbooks, grammars, dictionaries, lexicons, and primers in the Ukrainian language citing the danger that these would uh, foster an unhealthy sense of separatism among the Tsar's subject. 
And the archaic term Little Russians, Mala Rossi, was dusted off in the 19th century and deliberately deployed by the Tsarist regime to undercut and belittle the claims of nationalists that Ukraine was a unique and distinct national community. The Valuyev circular decreed that Ukrainian, referred to in the document as Little Russian, was not a language in its own right, but merely a dialect. There is not, Valuyev himself declared, nor can there be such a thing as a Ukrainian language. Now, why not? According to His Imperial Majesty's government, there was no such thing as the Ukrainian nation. Ergo, there could be no such thing as a Ukrainian language. And this is the kind of logical thinking it took to be one of the Tsar's trusted ministers. There's no such thing as a Ukrainian nation, hence there cannot be a Ukrainian language. Outlawing the publication of Ukrainian works, even dismissing outright the claims of Ukrainian to a separate linguistic status of its own, did not, of course, mean that Ukrainian men and women stopped speaking the language. Nor did it mean that Ukrainians stopped thinking of themselves uh, as distinct from their Russian lords and neighbors. A subsequent decree issued by Alexander II and reaffirmed by his son and heir, Alexander III, banned the staging of plays, musical performances, and public lectures in the Ukrainian language, driving Ukrainian underground, confining it uh, to the home. By pushing the Ukrainian language underground, as it were, the Tsarist regime only made this sense of national distinctiveness all the stronger, particularly among the educated and cultural elite. By defining language politics in, the, uh, in terms of political dissent, the regime's policies yielded the unanticipated consequence of bringing cultural figures and political radicals in Ukraine closer together. Advocates of the Ukrainian language now found that they were regarded as critics of the imperial regime. And those radicals, socialists and populists, who advocated an end to the autocracy, now found natural allies among those champions of a distinct Ukrainian national identity. A prominent champion of the Ukrainian language put it at the time, language is not simply a symbol of understanding, because it is formed in a certain culture, in a specific tradition. And in this way, language is the most distinct expression of our psychology. As long as the language lives, the people will live on as a nationality. When the Bolsheviks came to power in 1917, Ukraine briefly uh, declared independence. But by the time the Civil War ended and the USSR was formally proclaimed in 1922, the Ukrainian National Independence Movement had been suppressed, and Ukraine was uh, reintegrated into the new Soviet state. The Soviet leadership publicly subscribed to a philosophy of equal representation for all national cultures. And in the spirit of what they called Druzhba Narodov, the friendship of peoples, national communities across the USSR were encouraged by Moscow to celebrate their language, to celebrate their heritage, culture, and history. We must not make the same mistake, Lenin said, as our czarist predecessors. The czarist empire had been a prison house of national communities. We must not fall into the trap of enslaving these minority populations, culturally, politically, and socially. It didn't matter to the Bolsheviks uh, because Bolshevik ideology maintained that in the long run, national distinctiveness itself would fade away. National distinctiveness is but a cultural manifestation of socioeconomic reality. Once the socioeconomic reality has shifted, once we are all living in socialism, and from socialism, the communist utopia paradise that follows, uh, a new culture will emerge. Bolshevik spoke of the concept of splijeni, of coming together, that the nations would merge into one. But until that time, whenever it may be, Ukrainian nationalists were free to march side by side along the other 100 plus nationality groups who populated the USSR, to march forward into communism. In the 1920s, the policy of koronizatsia, indigenization, was introduced across the USSR, a process whereby local state and party elites would be drawn from the local ethnic populations. And communities were encouraged to foster dual identities, to think of themselves as Soviets first, 
but as Ukrainians or Georgians or Armenians or Lithuanians, etc., second. And you can see in this poster, right? Long live the unbreakable freedom, uh, excuse me, long live the unbreakable friendship of peoples of the USSR. Here you see a Soviet poster from 1921. This in Ukrainian uh, shows an older man on the right in classic Ukrainian dress and mustaches in, in joining his son or grandson, this bull-cutted lad on the left, to study at the Institute for Red Commanders, to become an officer in the Soviet army, and to do so for the defense of the Ukrainian nation and the Soviet state. Joseph Stalin, however, was far less favorably inclined toward national sentiment uh, than had Lenin been. Lenin used to joke, in fact, that it was the non-Russians among the Bolshevik elite who always came down the hardest on manifestations of national distinctiveness, the Polish uh, Zerzhinsky, the Georgians, Orjana Kidzi, and Stalin himself. Stalin saw the rise of nationalist sentiment, particularly in Ukraine, as a challenge to central authority, particularly his own. And at Stalin's command, uh, the leadership of a Ukrainian cultural revival movement, uh, who had held power for most of the 1920s, were denounced as bourgeois nationalists in the 1930s, arrested, purged, and most of them shot. In their place, Stalin trucked in officials from Moscow, officials loyal to him. At their head, one of his most diligent servitors, Nikita Khrushchev. And some scholars have argued that the Ukrainian famine of 1932-33, which claimed millions of lives, was a punishment uh, designed by Stalin to decimate the country's national elites and thus prevent any potential political and social unrest in the country uh, down the road. It's not entirely clear, but what is clear is that when famine came to the region, a famine uh, brought about in part by poor harvest, but exacerbated by the disastrous policies of collectivization, when that famine came, the leadership in the Kremlin did nothing to relieve it, uh, a point that the Ukrainian government today uh, uh, remembers well. So how does any of this bring us closer to understanding the present crisis uh, in Ukraine? This map uh, shows <clears throat> the regions of the country uh, where mass protests took place at the end of 2013 and early 2014. As you can see, the sites of mass protests that brought down the Yanukovych regime in early 2014 were centered in uh, and largely confined to the Ukrainian-speaking West and center. Uh, the protesters who marched in Kiev's independent square were primarily Ukrainian speakers. That is, they consciously self-identified as such. And here you see a group of them uh, bearing the Ukrainian uh, national colors, blue and yellow. These protesters favored uh, closer ties to the Western European community, and they favored the cultivation of a distinct uh, Ukrainian national culture. By contrast, the former president's base of support lay in the Russian-speaking East, where large segments of the population supported the president's push for continued close ties with Russia. When President Yanukovych fell in early 2014, uh, it's no surprise, perhaps, that one of the very first acts of the new Ukrainian government was to repeal the language law of 2012. And the language law of 2012 had granted sort of quasi-official status to Russian as a co-official language in regions where at least 10% of the population claimed it as their first language. So in other words, in the eastern oblasts, in the eastern provinces, eastern districts, uh, Russian was granted uh, a kind of semi-official uh, equal status. This law was repealed by the new government in early 2014, and Ukrainian was asserted as the sole official language of the country. The most extreme Ukrainian nationalists today seek to treat the country's Russian speakers in much the same way as the czars treated Ukrainian speakers 150 years before. The extreme right nationalist party, Svoboda, or Freedom, has talked about the need for a bill that would strip Russian speakers who refuse to learn Ukrainian, would strip them of their Ukrainian citizenship. 
They've spoken also of banning within the country's borders all Russian programming altogether, soap operas included. And I think it's unlikely that measures such as this will pass. Uh, these are extreme positions coming from a place of anger, um, unrepresentative, I think, of mainstream political thinking in Ukraine. More reasonable voices have called uh, for a bilingual solution that would recognize both languages on an equal footing. But as this Ukrainian uh, cartoon suggests, bilingualism is not without its problems. On the left, you see this big, burly Russian figure with the Russian word for language, yazik, on his chest. Uh, and in Russian, the word uh, for language is masculine. And he is squeezing out a slight young woman uh, who is indicated by the Ukrainian word for language, mova, which in Ukrainian takes the feminine gender. And he says to me, pardon me, miss, but you're crowding me. Right? And the implication of this Ukrainian cartoon is that, it, in fact, it is the aggrieved Russian speakers who are, in fact, doing the crowding, taking up more than their fair share of the cultural space. This protester carries a sign uh, that asks in Ukrainian, do you want bilingualism? She obviously doesn't, so the implied proper response to that is no. Critics of the bilingual solution see it as a thin edge of the wedge question, one that would allow Russian to sort of slink back in uh, and perhaps resume a predominant place in Ukrainian society. And most Ukrainian voters are against that. And as long as relations with Russia remain strained or worsen, uh, the Ukrainian government in Kiev seems unlikely to embrace bilingualism. The everyday pressures felt by Russian speakers in central Ukraine and by Ukrainian speakers in the disputed territories in the east, uh, these pressures speak, I think, to the enduring nature of the language question in Ukraine today. On a mundane level, this has affected the names of bus stations, metro stops, streets, towns, cities, even entire provinces. And in this charged climate, simple matters of spelling and pronunciation are laden with political meaning. To refer to the eastern city of Luhansk by its Ukrainian pronunciation rather than its Russian, Lugansk, uh, conveys immediately to listeners the sympathies of the speaker, whether those sentiments are stated explicitly or not. Whether you spell the eastern provincial capital of Dnepropetrovsk with an E or an I may well reveal where you stand on the question of the political future of the eastern regions. So even with a delicate ceasefire in place since February, the language war is, I think, unlikely to fade away on its own. At the beginning of this month, at the opening session of the Constitutional Commission, President uh, Petro Poroshenko declared that no matter what amendments the lawmakers may consider, whether or not they introduce a more federal structure in which some political power would devolve from Kiev to the uh, provinces, no matter what else the commission may decide, the language question is off the table. Poroshenko said the Ukrainian language is and will remain the only state language of Ukraine. Poroshenko cited statistics. Three quarters of the Ukrainian population, he said, an overwhelming majority, are, quote, firmly convinced that there should be one state language and that Ukrainian, the Ukrainian language, is, quote, the backbone that holds the nation together the definitive statistics from the president, this former uh, chocolatier, a billionaire oligarch. And yet, how decisive are these statistics? Less than a week later, on April 10th of this year, the Kiev-based Institute of Sociology issued a report with far more modest numbers. 48%, fewer than half of respondents, said that they favored Ukrainian as the sole official language. So a far cry from the president's uh, unsubstantiated figure of 75%. According to the Institute, 33%, a full third, say that they would vote in favor of making Russian the second national language, whether alongside or behind Ukrainian was sort of ambiguous in the wording. 9% said they wouldn't vote at all on the question. 10% didn't know what they wanted. The language divide uh, is often understood in kind of sharply geographical terms that there's a sort of fissure between a Ukrainian-speaking West and a Russian-speaking East. Uh, and while that possesses a sort of uh, 
cultural and political resonance, the real uh, lines of demarcation are not so neat and tidy. A sizable percentage uh, of the Ukrainian population, particularly in the central regions, live, think, and speak, and operate on a daily level in a kind of Creole mix of the two languages, known as surzhik. And the word surzhik comes from the Ukrainian term for a bread baked of mixed grains. The language itself mixes Russian and Ukrainian vocabulary uh, into a commonly understood grammatical structure. Once written off as a bumptious and unliterary dialect, uh, Surzhik is regarded by many linguists today as a language in its own right. It's spoken in marketplaces, on public transportation, playgrounds, schools. Until recently, it could even be heard on the floor of the Rada, the Ukrainian parliament. Delegates have been encouraged of late to adhere to a purer form of what may or may not be their native tongue. So while it functions as a kind of everyday lingua franca for millions of Ukrainian citizens, and it has the advantage of being very nearly intelligible to Ukrainophone or Russophone speakers alike, Surzhik is unlikely to ever receive, I think, full endorsement by Kiev as an official or even co-official language. The politics of national identity in Ukraine today are too closely bound up with the symbolic significance of language and its connection to nationhood uh, to permit this sort of compromised tongue uh, to carry the day. The language question continues to be one of uh, sort of salience and resonance in Ukrainian politics. Take, for example, the grassroots group Prosvita, which takes a vigorously pro-Ukrainian stance on cultural issues, on the language question. The word Prosvita, uh, the name of this group means enlightenment in Russian, and it takes its name uh, from another brotherhood of Ukrainian intellectuals in the 19th century. There was no shortage of them. When Viktor Yanukovych won the presidency in 2010, Supporters of Prosvita and other Ukrainian national identity groups were appalled. The president-elect gave press conferences and spoke in public in the Russian language. How could the leader of a free Ukraine uh, speak publicly in Russian? One parliamentary deputy put it at the time, it's terrible to imagine how Yanukovych is going to mistreat Ukraine's culture and history in the future considering how he mistreats the Ukrainian language. The head of Prosvita, a poet, uh, Pavlo Movchan, declared that we need to create a united, integrated nation. This is the task facing Ukraine in the 21st century. That means we must have one common language. Everyone must speak the state language, Ukrainian. The Ukrainian state must use the powers of the central government to promote the primacy of Ukrainian through the education system, the media, courts of law, culture, and so on. All states do this, he says. They don't, but all states do this. And for us, it's a matter of national urgency. On the other side, you have advocates for the interests of Russian speakers in Ukraine who argue that the main task before a democratic state is the defense of equal rights for all. The chairman of the grassroots organization, Russian Speaking Ukraine, which defends the rights of Russian speakers in Ukraine, declares that there is this pervasive suggestion that if you speak Russian, you're not a loyal or true Ukrainian. This makes Russian speakers feel like second-class citizens. So in both cases, the debates uh, on either side are over uh, the question of authenticity, over what makes a real Ukrainian. And deeply embedded here is the conviction that language matters as much or more than uh, blood, borders, and culture. That language uh, is this sort of uh, ineffable characteristic that what defines a true member of the Ukrainian nation. Last fall's parliamentary elections seem to suggest uh, that a middle ground consensus on these cultural questions may be forming. The most radical parties on the far left and far right uh, had poor showings. Uh, the two leading centrist parties won a plurality of the vote. Uh, the Poroshenko bloc, along with the People's Front Party, led by the Prime Minister, Arseniy Yatsenyuk, uh, combined for 44% of the seats in the Rada. And these parties have their differences. Over the past decade, Ukraine's presidents and prime ministers have not uh, historically gotten along all that well. 
Uh, but these two parties appear to have formed, uh, for now, a stable, uh, although far from unshakable, coalition government. Both parties have declared in favor of retaining Ukrainian as the official language of the country. Uh, they have tabled talk of bilingualism. They're certainly not about to embrace Surzhik, but they have expressed concern and support for the rights of Russian speakers in the East. Uh, where that eastern border will ultimately be drawn, of course, remains to be seen and depends on how long this precarious uh, ceasefire currently in place can last. So, finally, the question facing Ukraine uh, is one that is common to democratic regimes, liberal societies uh, around the world. If Ukraine is to become or remain a democratic regime, depending on how you view it, if Ukraine is to become or remain a democratic regime, its leaders and its people need to find a way to resolve the language question in such a way that the wishes of the majority are reflected uh, while the rights of the minority are secured. Uh, easier said than done, but this delicate balance is, of course, uh, in the final analysis, what democracy is all about. It remains to be seen, of course, whether uh, that balance will be struck. Thank you uh, for your time. If you have questions, uh, there's a microphone over there. Please uh, go over to the microphone and speak into the microphone. And we'll, let's see. Oh. OK, to be the first. <clears throat> I understand Professor Mayer cautious warning. Excellent. It's a jouissance, very good. Concise to the point, fantastic. And <clears throat> you made it very clear that the the space of variation between a failed state and a rogue state, the space is very contracted, I mean, it's very small. And uh, as you know, Ukrainian suffered this kulak, uh, uh, annihilation of kulaks, 20 million kulaks disappeared, or were annihilated by Stalin. At the same time, during Second World War, the Ukrainian were the best capo in the Holocaust, in the concession camps. So they can, it can go either way, failed or rogue state. And, but uh, let's speak about the West, because uh, I'm very interested about this Western projection, capitalist projection, which has uh, taken advantage of the collapse of the USSR. If you remember, uh, there were a tacit agreement, and you are a historian, I'm not, so uh, help me there. There was an agreement that the West Europe, spearheaded by Germany and the US, were not going to push NATO agenda in this central part of Europe, which is divided between the West and the Asian hydraulic empire, to use the term of Marx. So the US, NATO, Europe, has a definite role of provocation. They threw gas on the fire, on the linguistic fire, uh, pushing some uh, not extremists, but trying to push the decision away from, you know, to, to pull the past of Ukraine on this side of the divide, which of course, what do you expect the Russian to do? So I would like you to, and it's not directly linguistic, but I think it's very to the point. So could you help me there because I'm not a historian. Does that make sense or? I think, um, uh, thanks, Michelle, for the question. I think uh, the the question of NATO expansion is is uh, a very important one here, and it's one that Ukrainian uh, politicians and citizens uh, are divided on. And it's certainly a question that uh, is in the minds of the Russian government at this time. I mean, there are uh, assurances to the contrary. Uh, the borders of uh, uh, NATO, or NATO, NATO member states have pushed uh, decidedly uh, to the east and to the south, uh, into the Caucasus. And so I think this is a, this is a matter of, 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 of great concern. This is perceived uh, by not only the Russian government, but I think most Russian people uh, as provocative and unnecessary. The Warsaw Pact is long gone. Uh, it only ever succeeded in invading its own fellow members anyway. Uh, so why on earth is there a need for, for NATO, right? 
Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure there's a good reason for that. I, I've never really heard a good reason for the expansion of NATO uh, in this day and age, but I'm, I'm sure its advocates have their reasons. But I think that you, know, you could make the argument that the language struggles of today, uh, in a certain sense, you know, have to do with, with what the future of Ukraine is going to be. Is Ukraine going to turn its face to the West, politically, economically, uh, culturally? This seems to be uh, the sentiment among a younger and more educated segment of the Ukrainian population. Uh, or are Ukrainian pensioners going to settle in and watch Russian dubbed programming and sort of turn their face uh, to the East? This is, this is, uh, a question that there's great divisiveness on. Uh, those of you who are following the news in the last week, uh, the Ukrainian parliament uh, passed a bill, and I'm sure the Ukrainian president will sign it if he has not already, uh, that has been described as decommunization uh, policies. Uh, some say it's a violation of free speech, others say it's high time and long overdue, uh, but essentially it would criminalize the display of the hammer and sickle the symbols of the old Soviet regime. Uh, provisions in the bill uh, would, <clears throat> uh, would, would, would make it so that textbooks and uh, news agencies would refer to uh, the Second World War as the Second World War, not the Great Patriotic War, as it's known in, in Russia to this day. Um, to a certain extent, this is about uh, re, you know, reimagining or coming to terms with Ukraine's past uh, in the Soviet Union. This is a question that many of the successor states in the Baltics, um, to a lesser extent Belarus, I think, uh, have, have, have grappled with over the past two decades. Uh, but it's also uh, a question that's laden with, I think, cultural and linguistic resonance. When, uh, when the Ukrainian parliament today speaks of Soviet repression, they are conflating uh, Soviet with Russian, uh, and not at all accidentally, I think. Um, so where this will all go, I have no idea. But it's interesting to sort of think about how these debates are unfolding today about how the Soviet past is going to be remembered, not as Druzhba Narodov and friendship of peoples marching forward under the banner of Lenin to a glorious communist future, but rather uh, as a story of oppression. This is how the Ukrainian government is going, to, is going to write the history of the 20th century now. This is how the history of, the, of, of uh, 20th century Ukraine is going to be taught to a generation um, and, and more of Ukrainian students. Uh, the Ukrainian government back in 2010 uh, passed a bill, the Rada passed a bill, uh, that declared the famine of 1932-33 uh, an act of genocide, an act of genocide perpetrated against the Ukrainian people by the Soviet regime. Uh, so what happens with NATO expansion and, and, and sort of future political and economic orientations, I think, is very, very intricately bound up with, with how the 20th century past is going to be remembered moving forward in the 21st century. So, thanks. Yeah. yeah, thanks again for your presentation. Um, I think that one of the in really interesting ways that national consciousness forms is through the diaspora and through diasporic communities. And I was wondering if you had any knowledge of the role the Ukrainian diaspora played in the formation of Ukrainian nationalism, yeah. you know, over the mm -hmm. past cent few centuries and then leading into the current situation in Ukraine. Yeah. That's a great question. I mean, the Ukrainian diaspora uh, is sizable, has been uh, for quite some time. Large numbers of uh, Ukrainians uh, emigrated to points west in Western Europe at the end of the 19th, early 20th century. Uh, many more came to the United States. Uh, even more went to Canada, the closest geographical similarity to Ukraine that they could find in this hemisphere. They, they, they moved to Canada. And to this day, uh, <clears throat> less so in the United States, more so in Canada, I think, um, there is a, a, a sort, of, uh, sort of Ukrainian uh, uh, presence in, that, that, that makes its voice felt in politics. If you look at uh, some of the statements from the Canadian ambassador to Russia, 
why you would look at statements from the Canadian ambassador. I don't know why I said if you've If you've looked at this, the Canadian ambassador's reports lately, you'll see that uh, it's, it's actually come under great criticism from, from Moscow because the Canadian ambassador has repeatedly uh, called out Putin and, and, and very expressly, very deliberately uh, uh, critical uh, to, to Russian presence in eastern Ukraine, the Russian military presence in eastern Ukraine. Uh, and the, the Russian government has responded angrily that the Canadian, amba Canadian ambassador is uh, a tool in the hands of the Ukrainian diaspora community, uh, which is a code word for, for God knows what. But uh, the Ukrainian diaspora movement, and I think this is true <clears throat> to a certain extent of the Russian uh, diaspora movement that emigrated after the revolution of 1917 and ended up in the uh, cafes of Prague and Paris and came to New York and, and San Francisco as well, um, some have argued that it's in these diaspora communities where men and women uh, are divorced from their homeland and all that goes with it that, uh, ironically, perhaps sentiments of national uh, desire and longing grow even stronger. Uh, and so I think that the long-winded answer to your question is that, yes, the diaspora uh, has played a large role, I think, in sort of keeping the flame of Ukrainianness. Uh, alive. Most, uh, many, many Ukrainian, uh, I'm sorry, many Canadian public universities have endowed chairs in Ukrainian studies, uh, chairs that have been uh, funded uh, by you know, wealthy Ukrainian uh, Canadian citizens who have an interest uh, in the sort of culture and history of their region. You don't find that very often uh, in the United States. Harvard is an exception, but um, yeah, definitely the, the diaspora plays a uh, a key and I think ongoing role in in the fostering of national identity. Absolutely. Um, any other questions? Any answers? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you all for coming out tonight, and once more, let's thank Rob Green for. Uh, his talk.